Mark Menzies was a Tory MP who has also acted as a trade envoy for the UK, but no more because he has been suspended from the Conservative Party and sacked from his diplomatic role. The suspension follows a series of fairly worrying allegations about the misuse of campaign funds revealed by a Times investigation. Here's how the eyebrow-raising story begins. Last December, a 78-year-old woman who had once been Mark Menzies' campaign manager received a phone call at 3.15am in the morning. The Times reports what she heard. Are you on your own? The man said with urgency in his voice. I've got in with some bad people and they've got me locked in a flat and they want £5,000 to release me. The caller was Mark Menzies, 52, the Conservative MP for Fylde in Lancashire. According to the Times, Menzies asked the former staffer to hand over thousands of pounds from an account containing donations to his election campaign. The story continues. She told Menzies that it was 3.15am and she couldn't transfer any money without leaving the house. He became angry, allegedly telling her it was a matter of life and death, and demanding she instead lend him money from her own savings, according to an account she subsequently given to friends in the Conservative Party. The woman refused and told the MP that she would speak to his longtime constituency office manager, Shirley Green, in the morning. A few hours later, Green stumped up the money, telling local Tories she'd cashed in her ISA to do so. By then, the sum demanded had risen to 6500 Now, when someone tells you in the middle of the night that they need a large sum of money in a life or death situation and you refuse, it's usually for one or two reasons. Either you don't really like the person or more likely, it's a pattern of behaviour you're all too familiar with. So Howard Menzies ended up supposedly locked in a flat with people demanding money from him. The Times article goes on to say this. A source close to Menzies said the MP had met a man on an online dating website and gone to the man's flat before subsequently going with another man to a second address where he continued drinking. It was falsely claimed that he'd been sick at one point and several people at the address then demanded £5,000, claiming it was for cleaning up and other expenses. The source said Menzies decided to pay them because he was scared of what would happen otherwise but did not have the funds to transfer the money from his own savings. His aides gave him money as friends who wanted to help. After receiving thousands of pounds from Green, Menzies allegedly summoned a junior staffer to come and collect him from the flat. When the staffer arrived, he too gave Menzies money, handing over all the cash he had on him, a sum amounting to a few hundred pounds. According to the report, Menzies said he owed it to two other men. But that wasn't the end of his request for money, with the Times reporting this. The following day, on another call, Menzies said he needed another 35000 for medical bills. Told there was no more money in the campaign funds bank account, Menzies was unperturbed. Oh well, we'll raise some more, he allegedly replied. Shirley Green, who had handed over the thousands that Menzies had asked her f- from her own savings, was reportedly later reimbursed from his campaign funds. A source close to Menzies told the Times that Menzies said he had offered to reimburse that campaign account from his own funds, but claimed that the local Tories who controlled the account told him that it wasn't necessary. But this wasn't the first time Menzies had taken money from his campaign's accounts. The Times reports this. Four years ago, shortly before the outbreak of the pandemic, Menzies called his former campaign manager, seeking 3000 from campaign funds, she has told friends. He claimed to have personal medical bills due urgently that he could not pay and promised to sell some shares in order to repay the money. The former campaign manager and Green authorised the transfer and Menzies received it. But the MP is understood never to have repaid the money. Instead, he asked for, and received, a further sum of £4,000. Several years passed before Menzies again received funds from the account in November. By then, Green had been replaced as an administrator by another local party member. The sum received amounted to £7,000. Menzies has not repaid any of the £14,000 he has received from the business group fund, money that had been given by donors for campaigning and not for personal expenses. In January, Shirley Green reported Menzies to Tory chief whip Simon Hart, She accused Menzies of misusing donors' money and alleged abuse of privilege by putting pressure on staff to hand their own money over to him. But despite being made more than three months ago, CCHQ has still not completed its investigation into Green's complaint. However, the Times report seems to have now spurred the party into action. A spokesperson for Simon Hart said this. Following a call with the chief whip, Mark Menzies has agreed to relinquish the Conservative whip pending the outcome of an investigation. 
Mark Menzies has denied the allegations, telling the Times this. I strongly dispute the allegations put to me. I fully complied with all the rules for declarations. As there is an investigation ongoing, I will not be commenting further. The current investigation isn't Menzies' first brush with scandal. In 2014, a Brazilian sex worker told the Daily Mirror that Menzies had paid him for sex and asked him to buy drugs for the MP. Menzies quit as a parliamentary private secretary then and hasn't held a ministerial position since. In 2017, Menzies was questioned by police over accusations that he got a friend's dog drunk, resulting in a street brawl with the owner of the dog. More recently, Menzies has been accused of turning up drunk to a concert in his constituency, kicking over chairs and badgering other attendees. Helena, how did such a misuse of campaign funds and a seeming misuse of Tory party staffers go on so long without action from the whip? I think at the end of the day, what you have to realise is that the Conservative Party are not interested in the aspect of governance. The role of governance is something that is always secondary when it comes to the Conservative Party's actions. What their singular role is, is continually staying in power for whether it would be ideological or their own personal enrichment. Now, I'm not saying that applies to every single one of them, of course, or even necessarily in this case, but you've got to have a look at the, the whole kind of actions that they've taken. Of course, if somebody was taking a moral principle towards whether or not that we should properly have a level of transparency over these alleged actions being taken by MPs, again, this is not the first time. This is a long string of all of these issues that we've seen in terms of Conservative Party scandal. MP after MP after MP after MP has been implicated in things that are way, way below the kind of standard that we should expect from our elected representatives. But why would they? What would be the point in them in allowing any of these things to therefore go to something like the police, for example, if necessary, when it could result in negative PR for the party later on down the line? That's not good for your permanent campaign strategy, which we've seen them do loads of times, like essentially using public money to be able to shift barristers from being used to their proper role into making sure that they're doing things in terms of getting asylum claims processed because that's what's politically advantageous for them. Well, this does seem to me really and truly seem to be emblematic, again, if the story here is true, emblematic of the kind of people who have become Conservative Party and politicians in the first place, those who really don't understand the value of money because they've never had to understand what it's like not to have it, and therefore don't understand the value of other people's money, whether it be, you know, donations coming to the party to engage specifically for campaigning or the personal finances of Tory party staffers. Again, this is just the Conservative Party writ large, as we've seen throughout the Boris Johnson era up to now. Now, Mark Menzies is one of eight former Conservative MPs currently suspended from the party. He joins other ex-Tory MPs now sitting as independents in Parliament, including William Wragg, who earlier resigned this month after getting embroiled in a catfishing scam. On LBC, Nick Ferrari asked Defence Secretary Grant Chaps why Tory MPs cannot stay away from scandal. What is the problem with Conservatives and these sorts of incidents? Well, look, I, 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 I said slightly reject the sort of description there in as much as um, people, I'm afraid, in every walks of life who either don't do the right thing or sometimes are troubled individually, um, uh, perhaps with mental health and other things, which leads them to do things which they shouldn't have done. Those eight aren't all um, sitting in Parliament. But, as, uh, but, but why, now. why does it take the Times to reveal this? Why didn't the Conservative Party do more earlier, Mr Shapps? Well, my, my, my understanding was that uh, there was there were already uh, there was already something underway that CCHQ, uh, CCHQ already had that underway, but the new information has come to light perhaps through that newspaper. I'm not sure where from. I'm not privy to the... So it takes the Times, it takes the newspaper then to actually bring this investigation to some kind of conclusion. That's the reality, isn't it? uh, In a you know, you know, quite often it is a, a journalist who uh, uncovers a wrongdoing. It's, it seems to have been what's happened in the case of Angela Rayner as well with the um, the home. All right, uh, okay, I hear on that. Well. But, but, quite but, often but, the journalists but, are, the, are the answer to that. But lastly on this, with the allegation, the allegation concerning the use of funds, why wasn't that reported to police immediately? Well, look, as I said, I'm afraid I... Well, I put it to you, the attempt, not you personally, that was an attempt yeah, at a cover-up, Mr Shapps. I, I don't think so. What I understand is that some further information came to light yesterday that it's a conversation between the chief whip and the individual MP concerned. Uh, he denies these allegations. It should be added, but it's quite right that a, a proper investigation takes place and that he doesn't sit as a Conservative in the meantime, and I think that's a, a sensible approach. 
So, some new information apparently came up yesterday. No connection then to that also being most likely the Times deadline for comment before running their story. Helen, do you agree with Shaps's analysis there? Well, I'm glad Nick Ferrari said, oh, well, this is clearly an attempt at a cover-up, or he put, he put it to Grant Shapps that it potentially could be their attempt at a cover-up. Oh, well, the Times are going to go public with it. Well, I guess we've got to get ahead of that. I mean, I couldn't possibly comment on those kind of allegations put towards the Conservative Party. But one thing I really wanted to pick up on here is this comparison with like the Angela Rayner story, is if one person acting in accordance with advice before that they were an MP from some kind of financial expert that then comes to light later on and they say, well, I'm going to comply with it and if I need to pay up the money, then I will do, for example. As if this is somehow in any way analogous to anything that's gone on here from in, in terms of not reporting things to police, the scale of what's going on, the misuse potentially of campaign funds rather than, and, and uh, if the story is correct, what would look to be a deliberate misuse of campaign funds rather than the inadvertent taking of advice which didn't turn out to be correct in Rayner's case is quite frankly ridiculous. I mean, I mean, the whole coverage of the Angela Rayner story has been ridiculous. We've got Dan Hodges tweeting out daily updates on that one now, whilst we see things that are far more newsworthy and far more worthy of discussion being continually brought to light about how the Conservative Party acts. One thing I think was worth a lot of caution with these things, though, is that there's a risk. There's a big risk is this continual kind of cavalcade of kind of these stories coming out of Conservative Party MPs, whether they're true or not, obviously there are some ongoing investigations and levels of denial going on. But we have seen before this, even if this one turns out to be untrue, plenty of other true stories of Conservative Party MPs engaging in kind of behaviour that they are, should be above in terms of their positions as MPs. I mean, just look at Boris Johnson's personal history throughout politics, and they made him Prime Minister after all that. And also there's the Chris Pinch allegations. We run the risk of this kind of level of like normalization, hyper normalization, where if we just continually have story after story after story of Conservative Party MPs, or even MPs regardless of the party, regardless of which party they come from, because obviously no MP is perfect and no party is perfect, let alone the Labour Party, far from it. If we continue to keep having these stories of MPs engaging in misproprietary, what that will do is get the public used to the, this idea that this is somehow becoming of our political class when it shouldn't be. These should be the kind of scandals that blow apart parliaments when, if if they do indeed turn out to be true. I mean, is the kind of alongside the economic woes is what kind of did for the John Major administration with their, their kind of back to basics messaging and the the Stephen Milligan moments that happened around it. And where we have got some of this, uh, the surreal nadir of the ways in which our political class treat these sorts, these kind of stories with a level of unseriousness. It reminded me of a moment, I think it was on the Trevor Phillips go on Shine News, the Phillips show rather, sorry. And there was a moment when Aisha Hazarika, uh, future unelected legislator, <laughs> story for another time, was laughing and joking along with other commenters there about the story that she had about one time where allegedly Kemi Badenoch had said that she had hacked into Harriet Harman's emails. And they all just kind of laughed and joked along with each other. And this is serious. This is serious business. And I'm glad that it's currently being treated with seriousness. But if we don't, you know, treat these even more, these scandals even more broadly than they should be treated, they are being treated now, we run the risk of it becoming the new normal. And that's, that's a problem.